Uh, okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Let me introduce Professor Cheming for you. Professor Cheming Yu is currently an Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. He received his bachelor degree in microelectronics from Peking University in 2009, and he received his master and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 2011 and 2013, respectively. Professor Cheming was an assistant professor at Arizona State University from 2013 to 2018. Uh, Professor Cheming has a lot of honors. He received NSF Faculty Early Career Award in 2016, IEEE Electron Devices Society Early Career Award in 2017, and ACM Special Interest Group on Design Automation Outstanding New Faculty Award in 2018, Semiconductor Research Corporation Young Faculty Award in 2019, and Design Automation Conference Under 40 Innovators Award in 2020, and IEEE Circuits and System Society Distinguished Lecture. Professor Yu served or is serving many premier conferences, technical program committee, including IEEE International Electron Devices, IEEE Symposium on VLSI, IEEE International Reliability Physics Symposium, uh, Design Automation Conference, Design Automation Tents uh, and Test in Europe, uh, and IEEE International Conference on Computer Aided Design. Welcome, Professor Sheming Yu, and thank you so much for giving us this honor. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. And today we are going to uh, give this class lecture on the topic of the circuit design and silicon prototypes for computing memory for deep learning inference engine. And this is an outline of the today's presentation. First, I'd like to give an overview and background of the computing memory paradigm. This is a new paradigm to, emer to merge the memory into the logic and for the machine learning acceleration. And then I will give the survey of the recent computing memory silicon prototypes with the s technology first. And then I will go to the survey of the prototypes with r technology, which is one of the emerging number of memory. And then I will summarize the design challenges for computing memory. And then I will point out some future research direction. For example, this monolithic 3D integration. All right, let's get started. So the motivation. And as you may know, there are many efforts ongoing to develop the hardware accelerators for the machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, as you can see in the market, still the GPU dominates, especially the cloud. And this is because GPU can offer the high training accuracy and it's very flexible and programmable for different uh, machine learning models. But we do say there is a trend to use FPGA for the fast prototyping for the inference. And then there's a new trend to develop the domain specific architectures for the ASIC circuitry to further accelerate the machine learning workloads. And here is one example, tensor processing units from Google. So if you look at the energy efficiency for those different platforms here, and we like to use the t ops per watt as a metric. So this is essentially throughput divided by power, tera operations per second per watt. And the GPU can reach about like 0.1 t ops per watt. A GPU can support the floating point computation, therefore it's very accurate. And then the digital ASIC design using the silicon CMOS technologies today typically report an energy efficiency about one to 10 T ops per watt. And many of them use the fixed point computation, for example, integer eight computation. Therefore, the computation efficiency can be boosted and here, our approach is the analog mixed signal computation with either the CMOS technology like SRAM or emerging number of memories. So we call this computing memory. So here we try to merge the computation into the memory array. And uh, the resulting energy efficiency can be one order of magnitude even higher. So here in the 10 to 100 TOPS per watt. But of course, 
Here we have to employ many low precision inference techniques, uh, such as the quantization and, and, and the pruning and so on. But here the question is, can we achieve the same accuracy as a digital computation? So there's possible degradation of the accuracy if we employ the mixed signal or analog computation because it, it is sensitive to the noise and variations. So we will try to answer those questions in today's presentation. But the overall goal is to improve the energy efficiency, especially for the edge inference. So we do believe that the analog computing memory approach is a viable solution for the edge inference. And also it may enable the transfer learning with continuous possibly unlabeled data sets. So today's talk, we are going to focus on the inference, but I do want to point out that there's a possibility to uh, update the model in the field using the same approach. And, but we don't think that training from scratch is a good way to go with this kind of a new uh, computing paradigm. So still inference mostly sometimes updates for the training. So what is the computing memory? And here we have a brief comparison between the conventional approach, use a pure uh, digital approach, a deep neural network accelerator versus the computing memory. So in the conventional like the digital accelerator, for example, the TPU, uh, you may have many of those processing elements, PEs. Those are essentially di digital multipliers and adders to perform the multiply and accumulate math operations. So still the weights and the activations are stored in the shared SRAM in the global buffer. And then the shared SRAM may not be large enough to hold all the data. Therefore, we still need the DRAM access from the off chip. But here we try to uh, um, uh, um, optimize the data flow, try to reuse the on-chip data as much as possible. So this is the basic principle of the digital accelerators. And in the computing memory approach, then we don't have a clear boundary between the computation and the memory. So here typically we have many of those macros uh, with a memory array. So the weights are stored in the memory and then the input and output activations are transferred in between. So here those inputs can turn on multiple rows of the memory array, and then we can do the computation along the columns. So here in this case, the weight will be stationary. We only move the input and output data around the chip. Therefore, we don't need to remo remove the weights. We can save the energy and the bandwidth for moving the weight. This is unlike the conventional approach, you have to move both weights and the activations together. So the computing memory in principle can enable the parallel access and eliminate the math units. And uh, we can improve the data uh, movement energy efficiency. So here, let's take a closer look at the computing memory. If here we have one memory array, so those uh, rows and columns uh, will define a memory bit. So this box can either represent the S1 or the emerging memories, like one transistor, one resistor configuration. But no matter what, the principle is similar. If we have the input vector in parallel, then we can turn on multiple rows simultaneously. And then the input represented by the voltage will multiply by the conductance of the memory bits. Then the voltage multiplied by conductance will get the current. Then the current can be summed up along the column. Then this summation in the analog domain will effectively do the uh, accumulation of the weighted sum. Therefore, the column current will represent the vector and matrix multiplication dot product uh, output. And uh, in many cases, we may have to use the ADC and to digital converter to quantize the analog output to the digital output. 
And depending on the precision of the weight, we may need to do the shift and add process to uh, reconstruct the significance of the multi-bit weight. So we will go to the details later when we talk about SRAM and RAM design in more details. And here is a survey of the recent silicon prototypes with the SRAM technology. So why SRAM for computing memory? First of all, SRAM is a mature silicon CMOS technology that scale with the logic process. So today you have the TSMC 5 nanometer process available and possibly three nanometer very soon. So we do have those availabilities from the commercial boundary with very leading edge process. And the large array capacity has been demonstrated using the SRAM for the cache applications. For example, we have 256, 256 megabits SRAM array demonstrated. But if you want to use SRAM to do the computation, then we may have to modify the SRAM bit cell a little bit. And the first one is the conventional six transistor SRAM. So in this case, we don't need to do any modification, but still we can support the computation. For example, here is the data we stored in the cross coupled match. And then we may enable the VLAN by the input vector. And then in this case, then there will be a large current from the bit line because <clears> the <throat> Q stores zero and then the path state is fully turned on. So imagine we turn on multiple rows, then we are going to accumulate the such discharge current from the bit line. And since we turn on multiple rows, then the bit line bar may also decay as well. But the discharge current in this case will be much smaller from the BL bar compared to the BL. So to further enlarge the sense margin, because here we have both sides uh, discharging. So what we can do is to split the VLAN. So here those two pass gates can be controlled by two uh, VLAN, like VLAN and VLAN bar. So in this case, then we can uh, perform the so-called XML operation. So the input can have the complementary signal like one and zero. So in this case, then the left pass gate is fully off and then only the right pass gate is on. So you only have the discharge current from the bit line. So in this case, the sense margin can be larger. And then the, the, uh, there's a challenge in the conventional 60 SRAN cell that is the rate of disturb. So if we turn on the VLAN and then this uh, storage node will be increasing the voltage and then it may flip the data if the voltage uh, is charged up. Therefore, to decouple the read and write process, what we can do is to add two additional transistor here, like another pass gate pairs. And then the storage node will control the bottom pass gate and then the another like read VLAN will control the top pass gate. So in this case, then the data zero here will completely uh, cut off the discharge current. Therefore, there will be no uh, disturbance issue to the uh, storage node of the SRAM. Of course, here the overhead is two additional uh, transistor, but the sense margin and the reliability can be improved. So the uh, final design here I showcase is the transposable AT design. So in many cases in the machine learning, if we consider the back propagation, then we need to read the data from both, both the column wise and the row wise. Therefore, we need to do this transposable bidirectional read. And then the idea is to add another set of the pass gates in the rotated 90 degree direction. Therefore, we can do the forward computation and also the backward computation. So there are many variants of such designs available in the literature. And then I will go through some of the representative designs in the next. So here is a summary table in the 
uh, which summarized NACA's re recent significant um, prototype chips uh, reported in the major conferences, NACA SCC, and uh, with the S brand technology. And here we uh, noted the cell structure, which means the, like the uh, split uh, conventional six transistor or split six, 60 transistor or the 80 transistor and so on. And also the, the uh, uh, cell size in terms of S square and the subarray size and so on. And then here's the energy efficiency are all normalized to one bit by one bit by cooperation because in different designs, they may support different precisions of the input data and the weight data. Therefore, to have a fair comparison, we have normalized everything to be like one bit input multiplied by one bit weight. And here, uh, as you can see here, the energy efficiency, if you use like this definition, can be super high, like 5,000 kilowatts per watt from this paper. This is a seven nanometer design reported in the last year ISCC from PSMC. So uh, the energy efficiency can be very good. And uh, here, I think there are more uh, data from different groups. I will skip this slide. Basically, this is a continuing table. So I will pick a few representative designs and then talk about their key features. So here, this is one of the pioneering work. Uh, developed by the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. And also our group is in collaboration with the, the National Tsinghua University in this design. So in this case, we use the split 60S run, and, but we use a compact design rule from the foundry. And then this is at the 65 nanometer process and a relatively small four kilobit macro. And uh, in this case, we demonstrated the MNIST uh, uh, accuracy and also the uh, energy efficiency for one bit by one bit operation. So this is a, a, a starting point. This is not very high if you consider this only one like one bit by one bit. But this is uh, the starting point of this kind of uh, 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 research. And uh, here are some key features in the design. So this is conventional 60 S run cell, but we do split the word and the word bar to uh, enlarge the sense margin. And uh, uh, also we use the uh, count mode, uh, sorry, the uh, voltage mode, sense amplifiers to quantize the bitman voltage. So as we turn on multiple rows, then the bitman voltage may decay depending on how many rows are discharging. And then we will use uh, ADC to quantize the anode voltage from the bitman. And uh, I think we use like three bit ATC in this case. And then in the second uh, year, we improved the design because we realized the uh, disturbance issue in conventional six transistor s run cell. So in this case, we use a uh, eight transistor s run cell and we call it twin AT cell because uh, we can support higher precision, with precision. So in this case, uh, maximally we can uh, support four bit input weight and five bit uh, weight uh, precision. And, and the uh, energy efficiency in like 26 kilops per watt uh, for this four bit and five bit multiplication. So I will show some of the details of the design. So this is a twin AT cell and uh, that two uh, eight transistor S run cell. And uh, uh, the difference is that here in the, that attached to the same bitman, but the uh, W over L of the MSB, this most significant uh, cell, this, uh, this size, the uh, W over L has been increased to twice of the right branch. Therefore the current that is discharged through the most significant bit can be doubled. Therefore, this can represent the significance in the weight. Because here, the s run can only store one bit per cell. If you want to represent two bits, then the MSB needs to double the discharge current. So we use the transistor sizing to do this uh, effectively. 
So then here we can represent the two bit weight from the MSB and the LSB. And then also for the input precision, we can tune the wireline voltage uh, to modulate the discharge current. So we can support two bit input use four voltage levels to control the path gate discharge strength. So by combining those uh, techniques, then we can eventually achieve like a, a high precision computation. And using the similar approach, I think the KSMC demonstrating the seven nanometer SRAM and in the last few years ISDC, the same AT uh, design, but of course they can use the latest technology. Therefore the four bit by four bit uh, multiplication, the energy efficiency can be like 350 T of per watt. So this is a, 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 a kind of record. Of course, I think this year, the recent ISAC, just uh, two weeks ago, may have some new results, which I didn't include here. So in the TSMC's design, one difference is that uh, they use the capacitor array as the edge of the uh, uh, SRAM macro to uh, do the ADC. And in our previous approach, we use voltage mode sensing, but in this case, they use the charge transfer mechanism, a switch cap to uh, to to quantize the bit and uh, uh, voltage. So there are some subtle difference in the peripheral circuit design. All right, so a brief summary. Uh, so we believe that Astro is a mature candidate. Uh, because you can have the availability at the leading edge and technology loads. And uh, 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 the main disadvantage of the SRA is that the leakage current may dominate if the SRA is very large capacity. Six transistor SRA is the most compact design, and, but there will be the rate disturb issue, so we cannot turn on many rows at one time. So the eight transistor SRA can decouple the read and write path therefore offers more flexibility. Uh, so Foundry typically offers a six transistor and eight transistor SRAM compact design rule. So if we need to further change the bit scale, uh, adding more transistors or changes uh, like uh, the bit line and the word line and, and that direction, then we have to handcraft the design rule, which will result in much larger scale layout area because the Foundry design rule is very optimized. And uh, in the old technology node, there are more flexibilities to modify the design rule. Um, but uh, in more advanced technology node, like the 28 nanometer or below, then the foundry typically will not allow to make any changes to the foundry design rule. All right, so the next topic is the uh, RM based prototypes. So, why RM? So, first of all, what is RM? This is a resistive random access memory. And uh, essentially it's a two terminal resistor, uh, but the resistance can change. So this is typically like an oxide between two metal electrodes and we can soft break down the oxide to create this conductive filament. Therefore the device is in the low resistance state, but we can also apply reverse voltage to rupture <laughs> the filament then the device can go back to the high resonance state. Therefore, we can have different resistance to represent the data. And uh, compared to the SRAM, as the same technology nodes, the RRAM is much smaller in cell size and also possibly to offer multi-bit per cell. So if we have four resistance levels, we can naturally store two bit per two bit data per cell. And therefore, we could potentially hold most of the weights on chip. And uh, uh, for typical uh, deep neural network model, we may need like tens to hundreds megabytes uh, uh, of the on chip memory to store the data. So if, can, if we can store all the weights on chip, then we can eliminate or reduce the off-chip era access. And uh, another advantage for the RRI is that it's more volatile memory. That means after we power off the chip, then the data is still there. So this is unlike SRAM. Every time when you power off the chip, then the data is gone. And so you don't need to reload the model to the chip if you store it in the RAM. 
So this is good for the dynamic power gating, especially for the edge device. Uh, if you have a long standby mode, then you can power off the inference engine completely and until you receive a wake up signal to uh, uh, instantly, instantly turn on the inference engine after receiving the wake up. And R1 is becoming technology, uh, technologically mature with boundary availabilities. And uh, the uh, vendors of R1 and, uh, include like Winbound, Sony, Panasonic. Uh, so those offers like R1 standalone for set. But uh, 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 we are also seeing that Foundry, for example, TSMC, is offering the RM process as a commercial service uh, already. And Intel has their own RM process as well. So here is a summary of the RM-based computing memory prototypes reported in the recent uh, major publication venues. And uh, 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 here I will not go into the details of the table and uh, uh, but we can talk about a few representative designs in the next. So this is just uh, uh, for your information. There are quite a few uh, prototypes uh, from different uh, uh, groups. So let's say one of the representative design. So this is again from the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. So this is uh, well, one megabit, uh, one transistor, one resistor based uh, design and uh, uh, the it can support that a uh, uh, three bit weight and also that like, two bit input. So we we can show some of the de design details here. So basically, we still have like a, a memory array, and then one of the challenge for the RAM based design is that the RAM current uh, can be large because the resistance. Uh, can be very low, like a few kilo ohm. Therefore, the quantum current uh, may be too large for the sense amplifier to handle. So one technique here is to use a current mirror to downscale the current from the quantum and to the real sense amp. And uh, during this downscaling, we can also play the trick to size the transistor W over L to do the mass to do the uh, multiplication of the uh, MSB and LSB. So from the MSB column, we can use, for example, W over L2 equals to two. And then for the LSB column, we just use W over L equals to one. Therefore, we can combine those two currents to do the uh, addition and, 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 and to, to represent the high precision weight. And then the second year, the same group reported a more advanced RM process. I believe this is the 22 nanometer RM process from TSMC. And uh, uh, it can uh, support even four bit by four bit uh, multiplication. So in this case, I think the, there are some tricks to encode the uh, 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 data into this two complement uh, code format, therefore we can handle the negative uh, weight as well. So you don't need to use two arrays to represent the negative values. You can just use one array, but use a two complement code to represent the negative values. Here are some details of the design. I will skip that. Uh, as the two complementary values need to be combined at the very end of the process because you have to invert the data and then shift the data. And then I will talk about some of our own work in this area as well. So this is our uh, practice uh, with the 90 nanometer one bound RM process. So this is a vendor from Taiwan who offers half oxide RM at 90 nanometer node. It's a relatively older technology node as an RM and um, characteristics are pretty good. So in this case, we demonstrate the X law operation. That means we can uh, have the inputs to be also negative values. And then we will look at some of the design details. So in this design, 
uh, we use two cells to represent the positive and negative weight. And we can have the complementary data pattern here. For example, the positive weight is next iron state on the top cell and lower state on the bottom cell. And if it's negative one weight, then we have the lower state on the top and iron state on, on the bottom. And therefore, we can have this uh, truth table of the multiplication uh, of the inputs and the weight. And uh, you can say this is an x small operation. So uh, if uh, the input is one and weight is one, then output is positive one, then there will be a low resistance pass between the bit line to the ground. Therefore, we basically count how many discharge paths uh, along the column. Or equivalently, we can think of the column is a pull down network like this. And then we count how many of those pull down network paths are enabled during the computation. Therefore, it will effectively change the bitline voltage here, which is controlled by a pull up PMOS. And then later, we will need to use ADC to sense this BL voltage. And in this case, we have like a three bit ADC by seven uh, voltage modes since an amplifier. So some more details of the device technology in this case. So uh, this technology does, in, uh, does support a uh, two bit per cell. So this is a different feature compared to the s -brand. So for s -brand, you can only have one bit per cell. But in this case, we can store two bit per cell. So how do we do that? Uh, so for the r run we can program the conductance of the device. It's a resistor, right? So we have the conductance. So we can program the conductance into four levels. Therefore, it can represent two bits data. So here are some experimental results. And we use a write and verify technique to tighten the distribution of the R1 in one array to those four levels. And uh, uh, those conductance are linearly spaced between zero, one, two, three. And then initially we can achieve very tight distribution, but as time goes by due to some relaxation and effects, then the distribution tend to spread out. Um, but we need to consider this kind of non-ideal effects into the accuracy uh, estimation. So this may degrade the inference accuracy if the distribution becomes too wide. And then here are some more features of this design. I will skip the details due to the time limit here. So here the summary for the RM based design. So in the RM based design, typically we need to use one transistor to control the RM cell, or like one T one R or two T two R. And the cell area typically ranges from like thirty F square to sixty F square. So it's much smaller than the S run at the same technology load. It is about like two to five times higher density than the S run. And R has a potential for the multi-level cell operation. And but we have to further optimize the reliability to minimize the relaxation and uh, uh, consider the drift of the resistance and uh, consider the retention at higher temperature. So those may negatively impact the inference accuracy. And also the RM based design based on challenges such as high programming voltage, especially in the first time programming with conforming process. So we may need like two volts or three volts. This is higher than the typical logic process power supply. So we need the network shifter to uh, charge up the, 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 the uh, operation voltage. And the right verify is needed in this case to accurately program the conductance or resistance to the desired value. And uh, the other downside for the R1 is that it lags behind the S1 in terms of the scanning. This of the R1 process is available at 22 nanometer. And, uh, but uh, we believe this may be a free spot for low cost edge platforms because five nanometer process will be very expensive if we can do everything at 22 nanometer for the edge device, then this may be a sweet spot. 
Okay, so I showed some prospects of the computing memory chips, but what are the challenges? So the first challenge we re realized is the ADC bottleneck. So ADC is required and two digital converter to quantize the column and output to the digital uh, bits. And uh, 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 the requirement here is unique. It does not need super high resolution or very fast bandwidth. That's three to six bits is enough. And this, uh, smaller than one gigabit per second is good enough. But there is a stringent requirement on the area because you think that here there's memory array at the edge of the array. Ideally, each column should be equipped with one ADC, but ADC area may be much larger than the column pitch here. Therefore, multiple columns may have to share the ADC. Or in other words, we cannot read out all the columns simultaneously. The parallelism promised by the computing memory is sacrificed if we cannot have the ADC per column. We have to use time multiplexing and do it sequentially from the column one, column two, column three, and so on. So this is uh, uh, the uh, because of the area of the ADC is much larger than the column pitch. On the other side, the power breakdown here shows that the ADC occupies more than 80% of the chip power. So it's very power hungry. Those are the bottlenecks of the whole design. And there are many ADCs available, options available. So typically there's a side ADC versus flash ADC. And the side ADC just use one comparator, but we dynamically tune the reference uh, according to the feedback uh, through the star logic. So basically we use like binary tree search to fine tune the reference, and then we can use multiple cycles to quantize the uh, bitnam voltage. And flash ADC, is simple. We just need multiple comparators, so you can get the output at the same time. So they will have different references. So the trade-off is very clear here. So the side is a take longer time, but smaller area, and also less energy. So we believe that for a like four bit or higher partial sum accuracy, we need the side is a, but for like the lower precision, we may use the flash ADC. And the second challenge here is the variation. As I mentioned, the analog compute uh, suffers from the noise of the variation. So there are two major variation sources. The first one is the cell-to-cell -cell unstable resistance variation. So that means, your, for example, your RSL, uh, even after programming, then the cells are not identical. So they may have different resistance. And so here we show some of the verified process. We will try to tighten the resistance around eight kilo ohm. So we need to use many iterations in the pulse programming to gradually tighten the distribution. But still it's not ideal, like a, 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 a perfectly eight kilo ohm. So the slight difference from cell to cell may result in different computation results from column to column. And also at the end of the corner, we have ADC. ADC may suffer from the offset due to the process variation. Therefore, those variations need to be taken care of uh, by the algorithm. And the neural networks may have some tolerance to such variations, but uh, if the variations are significant, then the accuracy will drop. So here we show some um, impact of the ADC offset. And uh, if we do nothing, then the accuracy for this data dataset can be very low to start with. But one way to compensate for the offset is to do the retraining. So that means for each chip, we can fine tune the weights after the manufacturing of the chip. Then we go through the fit forward process on chip and then use that to calibrate the weights that should be proven to this specific chip. Then if we do that fine tuning of the weights, then we can recover the accuracy after some iterations of the retraining. But still there will be slight degradation of the accuracy even after the fine tuning. And the fine tuning will take 
quite some effort in the testing phase of the chip manufacturing. And the third challenge here is the specific to the RM process because, because it's a relatively low unstate resistance and high rate voltage. So in the layout, as you can see, we need the level shifter to convert the voltage because we need like two or three volts to prevent the RM array. And also because of the uh, uh, low unstate resistance, we have to size up the max uh, to drive the RM array. Therefore, the array efficiency is not very optimal in this case. And here we just uh, showcase some device improvements. If we can do that, what kind of benefits we can get? This is today's RM, maybe unstate is like 10 kilo ohm, red volume is like 3.3 volts. But if we can improve the unstate resistance from 10 kilo ohm to 100 kilo ohm, or reduce the red voltage from 3.3 volts down to 1 volts, then we can greatly reduce the read energy and also improve the uh, right energy as well compared to the initial uh, device characteristics. So ideally, we need this kind of device targets that larger than 100 kilo ohm resistance and smaller than one volt programming voltage. So still device engineering is needed to achieve those targets. Okay, finally, I will uh, spend some time to talk about the future directions, which can mitigate some of the challenges we talked about so far. So here, we like to propose a monolithic 3D integration for the RM-based computing memory chip design. So the idea is straightforward. If we can partition the design into two tier, which can sequentially fabricate it, then we can use different technology nodes to handle the different part of the chip. For example, on the top level, top tier, the RM array uh, can use some old technology nodes, for example, 40 nanometer, as TSMC is uh, 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 providing the RM process, because here we need high voltage to drive the RM array. Therefore, we need the level shifter max with no high voltage transistor. But then the rest of the digital blocks can use more advanced technology nodes. In this example, for example, 28 or 16 or even lower, we can design those net buffer shift and add and ADC and so on using the more advanced technology nodes. And then we re rely on this metal inter tier layer for the communication between the two tiers. Of course, right now such kind of uh, fabrication is not available from the commercial foundry, but we want to do a design space exploration first, assuming that in the future we can do this kind of integration, this fan pitch integration. So here, this is a case study. If we want to design a 2.4 megabit RAM computing memory tile, uh, which consists of many subarray with peripheral circuits and many subarray will form a PE and many PE will form a tile. So we have those kind of configuration in the hierarchy and then we rely on the commercial mixed signal EDA design flow to uh, basically uh, lay out the design into two tiers. And here is the synthesis the physical layout for the 2D design versus 3D design. In the 2D design, the baseline is at 40 nanometer. Therefore, everything is on the same substrate. Now here we have the RM array, and we have the level shifter max ADC and digital control. So the idea is that for those high voltage transistors, like the RM array level shifter and max, they stay at 40 nanometer on the top tier. So in the 3D partition, so we will have them on the top tier like this. And then for the rest of the uh, digital circuitry, we can scale down in, in, in more advanced technology nodes. Here, for example, 16 nanometer. Therefore, we can have a balanced uh, area between the bottom tier and the top tier. And then we can evaluate the benefits of such design. And uh, uh, here we compare the performance power and area. So uh, uh, I don't want to go into the table but uh, just to draw the conclusion here. Uh, since we open the space in the bottom tier, 
uh, with the more advanced logic transistors. Therefore, we can have more space to place more ADCs on the bottom tier. So the count of ADC increased by eight times in this example. Um, but the instrument power is also increased by two times. And the, the energy efficiency is the throughput divided by power. And throughput is directly related to the count of the ADC. So it's like eight divided by two. Then the energy efficiency is improved by four times. So here is roughly from two TOS per watt to eight TOS per watt. And also the chip footprint is decreased by 50% by this 3D stacking. So this is the, uh, uh, the promise by the 3D design. Of course, this is not fabricated yet. This is a uh, prediction. And another concern for the 3D design is the thermal dissipation. Um, but fortunately for this kind of design, we evaluated the temperature profile in those two tiers. Uh, assuming the uh, power density, and we simulate from those two tiers. Then the temperature increase is very moderate, only less than 10 degrees C. So we think that the temperature is not a big problem here. The reason is that the computing memory approach is very low power density. And this here is a survey of different kinds of design in the computing memory a, a, a area. And the power density you see here is like one or two orders, uh, magnitude lower than the commercial and the PPU or the uh, uh, GPU. Therefore, the temperature is a pretty low for those computing memory approach because it's no power advantage. All right, so I think uh, uh, it's time to have a summary, summary here. So here, we talk about the computing memory, and uh, it's a good way to save the intermediate data movement. Um, uh, therefore, we can improve the throughput and energy efficiency for the machine learning acceleration. And uh, if we use SRAN, then it is available at the leading edge row, uh, node. Therefore, we can achieve very good energy efficiency. Today's RRAN has a potential, uh, but uh, it also needs to overcome some of the challenges such as the accuracy degradation due to the process variation and also the high voltage and uh, ADC overhead. But we think that the modernistic 3D integration as we showcase can be a potential solution. So we can place the R on top of the CMOS using different technology loads. Therefore, we can overcome many of the challenges as mentioned earlier. Therefore, we can fully unleash the potential of the computing memory. And uh, our group actually open source a simulator called BNN plus Neurosyn to benchmark different uh, implementations of the computing memory. So this is open source to the community from this GitHub link. So from this simulator, you can define the technology nodes, you can define the memory cell from S1 to R1 or even other memories. And then you can define the, define the uh, 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 neural network architecture, and then it will automatically generate the estimated performance. Uh, if you implement this architecture, if you implement one architecture using certain device technologies. So with this, I'd like to thank my collaborators in the research, uh, Professor Mengfan Chang from National Tsinghua University in the uh, SRAM based design and also Professor Jason So from Arizona State on the RM based design, and also Professor Sam Kyurin from Georgia Tech on the 3D design. And with this, I'd like to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Cheming, for this interesting talk. So please, if anyone has a question, can you write it to the, uh, to the chat section? Uh, okay, I can go with my question first. So, Professor, uh, here you said that uh, this resistor that you are using instead of SRAM in RR RAM uh, might be changed from 10 kilo ohm to 100 kilo ohm in order to reduce the writing voltage. Uh, what is the area effect on it changing this resistor? How does it change from 10 kilo ohm to 100 kilo ohm? 
Okay, so you asked a question about the resistance of the R run, right? So we mentioned that today's R run is not 10 kilo ohm, but ideally we want to improve that to 100 kilo ohm. So I don't think there's a big impact on the cell area because to, re to, to reach such high resistance, we have to modify the material of the R run stack. So it's more about the materials change instead of the uh, dimensional change or the layout change. So, so the foundry has to really uh, optimize the recipe fabrication and material stack to improve that. So I see some university papers reported that 100 kilo ohm RN and, and resistance, but most of the foundry today is only like 10 kilo ohm, even lower than that. So, so it takes some effort for foundry to adopt the new stack, but I don't see uh, impact on the cell area. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, looks like that's it for today. Thank you so much, Professor Cheming, for your talk. We really appreciate it too much. It was very informative and very beneficial for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, thank you, everyone, for being here today. We are really honored to have all of you. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.